Back here on Opposites Attract, John Stanko and Anthony Carlo are keeping you all entertained with uh, today's antics, and John's still not handling that one well, him sitting there with a Yankee shirt on. But we have uh, some basketball to talk about. The Nets will be cut down this evening, mm -hmm. um, and this is where the bet all stemmed from, but the uh, Yukon Huskies and the Kentucky Wildcats will be squaring off in the NCAA championship. I think it should be a great game. That tip offset for 9-10. First of all, that's an incredibly late tip. I don't know why the NCAA thinks that that late of a tip is a good thing. Uh, it should be 8 o'clock in my mind, but that's a separate issue. Uh, for us, it's a good it's a good thing for us. I mean, we'll, yeah, I guess so. We'll be able to watch it. But 9-10 uh, tip between the 7-seeded Connecticut Huskies and the 8-seeded Kentucky Wildcats. First of all, I want to say, anyone saying that this is a Cinderella matchup, just be quiet. Because these are these are two of the most historic programs in college basketball. Yeah. And whether or not they are underseeded or whatnot, they're not Cinderella stories with the talent that they have on their team. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. So um, I just wanna I just wanna put that one to bed. This is not a Cinderella matchup. This is a good matchup. It's an unexpected matchup. Unexpected. Yeah. But it's not Cinderella. Let's not classify it as that. There were upsets completed to get here. Correct. Yes, I, agree. I mean, look, look at what you Butler is a Cinderella. George Mason getting to the final yeah, four is a Cinderella. And BCU is a Cinderella. You not said, Kentucky, UConn. You said it the best. An unheard of program, usually not used to success in a tournament like this, yes. would be Cinderella. But both of these teams are used to it. Yes, that th this is this is not a Cinderella matchup. Granted, it should be a fantastic game uh, with two teams that have the clutch gene written all over them. Uh, what's what boggles my mind is UConn almost lost in the first round in overtime to St. Joe's. And then basically the rest of the way, they've been able to control the games for the most part and win by over five points in, in, in a significant margin, yeah. not having to win in the way Kentucky has with Aaron Harrison hitting that shot from the wing in back-to-back -back games to send them to the Final Four and now to the championship game. That's true. And and, and I know both of these teams have beaten, um, you know, obviously good opponents, but if you look at UConn and how you mentioned St. Joe's almost lost, look who they came back to beat in that in the fashion of just in complete control mm -hmm. for most of the game. I mean, you know, it's been amazing how Kevin Ollie has, has you know, um, you know, taken this team, which I don't think is the most talented team, but has, you know, used, utilized this team um, in, in a way that, they have been able to be more successful than, you know, names like Florida, who was predicted to win the whole thing, and mm -hmm. Michigan State, who was another favorite to win the whole thing. And, um, you know, Shabazz Napier has been a huge part of it. There's no question about that. Well, obviously. But it's been the contributions from everybody else, in my opinion, that was um, – that has been, you know, obviously the reason they've been able to make it this far. Well, I mean, I think that another thing that really helped UConn was their, they went up against, against Villanova. Uh, who, in my opinion, was not worthy of a two seed. In my mind, I think they had a great record, but I don't think they had the talent that the other two seeds have. Right. So they got that lucky break. And then I believe they went to go play Iowa State without Yang, without Niang, their starting center, seven foot center. So they went up against a banged up Cyclones team. And then they went, then they did beat Michigan State. Credit right. to them, Michigan State, an incredibly talented team. Yeah. But you want to know why they were able to beat Michigan State? They played two home games at MSG. They played two home games. Their regional were home games. All right, but let me ask think you. about that. Yeah, they no. played an hour away from their from their home facility. Yeah, but no, I understand that. We we brought that up in the first, when we were talking about that. How it's such a it's it is a pretty big um you know plus to have the the fans like that. But I don't think you could take that. I don't think, in other words, you can put. Uh, an extreme amount of emphasis on that on why they won. Is that what you you want I, to do? That I think you can definitely chalk up a reason for their victories to being in the crowd because they were down in both games to Iowa State and especially Michigan State. Michigan State came out in that second half against UConn, and I believe at one point I had like an eight-point lead, and they seemed to be handling it. If your crowd's not behind you in the game like that, you can fall behind by more. But if your crowd starts yeah. chanting defense, 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 getting you amped up, you can get back in the game, and I think that's what happened. That's so, true. Yeah, that, that, no, that's that, a good that's point. That's in my mind. Now, UConn, they, listen, you can't blame UConn for it because they, they got lucky with their draw. You you can't blame them for it. No. They took advantage of it, and now they're in the Final Four. They did have to beat Florida, and they Look, dominated Florida in the second half. Absolutely dismantled them. Yeah, no, they, exactly. I mean, to me, when you when you when you put it on paper, they beat you know, in my opinion, two favorites to win the whole thing. And when when it's all said and done, that's the answer. 
they beat two favorites to win the whole thing to get here. I mean, I, so you know what I'm saying? I am. So, so in I'm, other words, like, you know, by all means, they earned it. That's what I'm saying. I'm, no, I'm not. I'm not saying they didn't earn it. Listen, they still had to play basketball. Yeah, they still did so. But Mike Ritz worked the MSG games. He was there did for the Sweet really? 16 and the Elite Eight in MSG. He worked it. He wow. got sound bites at the end of the game. He says for both games, UConn was there. It was a 90 percent to 10 percent UConn crowd advantage. Yeah, I that's believe a home it. game. I believe it. Yeah. That's a home game it. in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. I believe it. I believe it. It does give them. It gives a lot of. It gives a lot of help to a team who's down, like you said. Listen, I agree, it, I agree it, with that. it has an impact. It may not be a lot, but it has maybe no. enough to push you over the edge. Now, uh, granted, they, they did beat Florida, and they again right. Florida in the second half they looked lost. And Florida took a very early, a big lead early on. They did. They were up, I believe, sixteen to four or something like that. It was something pretty, pretty. Um, pretty noticeable i mean and, and then you know uconn worked their way back they they fought back and all of a sudden like you said they took control completely in the second half yeah uconn dominated in the second half this and they deserve kevin ollie an unbelievable job coaching this team you know what you know what I'm, oh god you can finish your thought i'm just saying this team lost to louisville by 33 at the end of the regular season 33 to louisville and now look where they are now that yeah. turnaround that quick you got to give all the credit to the head coach kevin ollie you know all what amazes credit. me about kevin ollie his demeanor and how he expects to do it. You you feel that from him? How he he won't. I know coaches. I know a coach. What is he gonna do? He's not gonna come out and say, "Oh no, I didn't expect us to be here, and we're we're we're, we're lucky in this and that." But just the way he carries himself is that he won't. He he he. It's almost like he strives to know that they should have beaten those teams. Florida, Michigan State, like he expected to beat them. Well, every every coach expects that. I mean, that I don't I don't I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, I think I think that the players just love playing for Ali. You look at after the game, uh, I believe there was an interview where someone was trying to photobomb him after the game, and he slapped him when Kevin Ali got off camera. He was like, "Come on, boy, don't do that!" And he slapped him like a playful slap because he loved the because he loves joking around with his kids. Oh yeah. The yeah. players love playing for him. He gets down on the sideline, gets in that de- defensive stance because uh, I mean, I heard him say in an interview that he likes it. He likes getting a defensive stance because he likes to remember how he played in the NBA when he was in the NBA playing defense. Says right. it helps him understand the game more. Right. That's what I love about him is because he's so into the game when he coaches. He doesn't just stand there, arms folded like this, and no, examine, yeah. which works for some coaches. All the credit if you could sit down on the bench, analyze a game like that without being active. But Ollie, he makes himself active on the sideline. The players eat it up. It yeah. gives them energy, and then obviously they love playing for him. And I think that's been a huge, an absolutely huge part of them going this far. I agree with you. And when he's angry at them and, and you know yells at them and does what he has to do, uh, he's a player's coach, you know, because he'll never, you know, some coaches out there really, you know, they'll stick it to a player and not really give them the confidence they need then to pat him on the back. But you'll never see him ever yell at them and not give the guy a hug at the end or pat mm-hmm. him on the back. And it's important to have that. You don't want to go out there and play for a coach who you feel scared to make a mistake under. Obviously, you know, you, you're – you need somebody who does instill fear in you because you don't you don't want to have a pushover, but you always want to have somebody who's in your corner and who's fighting for you and who the players can relate to. And I think that Kevin Ali does that well. He, he does that incredibly well. Uh, now, now to switching to Kentucky, we mentioned how UConn was able to beat teams. They didn't really have to wait for like a final shot, uh, except for that St. Joe's game where they had the where they won by eight in overtime. Um, but you look at this Kentucky team after they got the the. I believe it was 56 to 49 win against Kansas State in the opening round. They beat Wichita State by two. Survived the last shot. Yeah, which was arguably the best game in the whole tournament. In my opinion, it was. They beat Louisville by five in a rivalry game, hotly contested throughout. Beat them by five. Which was an extremely big win. They I beat mean, big. Michigan by three. Aaron Harrison, huge that was, shot. That was Unbelievable. The, that was the uh, the last the last minute, the last 45 second. minute jump uh, uh, triple, right? Yeah, Aaron Harrison. Aaron Harrison knocked in down, down, knocked down shot with seconds left. Gives gives yeah. them the win. Wisconsin. Aaron Harrison down by two yeah. takes a three. Nick knocks it down from the same exact spot on the court that he knocked that he knocked shot that he knocked the knocked the shot down against Michigan. As I speak good English here. <laughs> um, but again, and all, out of all of that, doesn't it amaze you that these are freshmen? These are listen. They are hitting their peak at the exact right moment. Yeah. Coach Calipari could not ask for a better moment all season for them to finally. Have the light bulb moment says, oh, this is how you play good college basketball. Exactly. They had the potential, but they didn't put it together during the season. And now, when they needed to. But the fact that you have 
freshman composed like that in moments to hit big shots like Harrison, you know, both, you know, both times that he did. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, the, you know, uh, the Fab Five, you know, so, you know, a team like that, um, this is not, uh, to me, this is a, a, something that's so impressive, the fact that they're freshmen, and obviously they're not the, the Fab Five, but they, they're certainly a team that has impressed with not only all those last-second, you know, comebacks to, to, to win the game in the last seconds, but, um, you know, to do it all as freshmen. Mm -hmm. That just is amazing to me. It, it, it's a phenomenal story. You got uh, tons of storylines on each end. Uh, but before we do, we do have to pick a winner. Well, I'm going to stick with my... Because we remember we picked in the we picked la last show. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember that. I do. But I you you weren't able. Run. But now you have to pick your new winner. I so. do because Florida did me dirty. I'll stick with who I originally said. I said it'd be UConn against Kentucky, and I picked Kentucky to win. So I'm gonna pick Kentucky to win. Uh, I I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you on this one. Listen, the story that UConn's had with Shabazz Napier has been fantastic. But I think that down low, while UConn's been able to handle the front court of, say, Michigan State very well when they were right. undersized, right. I think that the ath the athleticism uh, yeah. of Kentucky down low is a little bit more purely athletic-wise than Michigan State. I agree. Um, with you. I mean, people, people can argue both ways. That's just in my mind. And they Ju crash the boards like nobody else. Julius Randle's a double-double machine. I think that Kentucky will be able to handle it down low. Uh, I think this game's gonna be pretty high scoring. I think I see maybe a 76 to 73 Kentucky win. That that's that's the way I see it. All right, no, I um, I I I agree with you that Kentucky is gonna come out on top. I agree with you that their athleticism down low is, um, you know, I I think that finally, um, also the fact that Napier and Boat Wright are going to have a struggle now with the the athleticism that's going to be you know guarding them. It's going to be the length of the Kentucky guards also going to be a problem yeah. for Napier. He hasn't he hasn't played a backcourt that has the length right that Kentucky has. Now Napier is quick and UConn knows how to turn the get turnovers. But uh, I, I agree that the Harrison twins aren't as quick, but they're bigger. And I think that the way that Kentucky offensive rebound, the way they get offensive rebounds, it's it, they're one of the best at doing that. And I think that UConn is, you know, something like, you know, the stat is um, 247th nationally or something like that when it comes to offensive rebounds, which is not there good. You, go. you know, <laughs> no, not, good not good at all. That's and okay. And Kentucky, you know, um, you know, plays at a very high level when it comes to that. So, you know, that's going to translate to second chance points. And I think that um, the offensive rebounding is going to be a key in Kentucky winning, in my opinion. It, it, it should be a good game. I, I want a good game. You want the championship to be exciting, regardless oh, yeah. of the finish. Um, again, I don't really have a vested rooting interest as to which team I see want to see win. I just I just want to see a good game. That, that That's what I really hope for in this one. And I, and I think we'll get it. I think we will. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that hands down it's going to be um, – it's going to be close, but, um, you know, everybody will certainly enjoy it. In other uh, college news, um, today, um, Steve Massiello, the Jasper's former head coach, uh, w who chose to sign with USF after leading the Jaspers to a MAC championship year and going on to a near upset against Louisville, um, he was offered the contract at USF. Obviously, the discrepancy was um, discovered in his in his resume that he did not graduate from Kentucky. He had uh, approximately, I think they thought, 10 credits remaining uh, to graduate, and the they terminated the contract, and he was kind of left out there in the cold for a while. We hadn't heard from him. We hadn't heard from Manhattan. We hadn't heard from really anybody. Mm -hmm. Now we find out Manhattan is looking to reinstate him as the head coach of the Jaspers after he graduates from Kentucky. Yes, he has been placed on unpaid leave until he completes his undergraduate degree at Kentucky. He will be retained by Manhattan, as you said. Uh, a quote from Steve Mazziello. I am extremely grateful and humbled by the opportunity to continue as the head coach of the basketball uh, for the opportunity to continue as the head basketball coach at Manhattan College. I made a mistake that I could have cost me my job at an institution I love. Details matter. Um, <laughs> so, yes, details do matter, in case you didn't know. Um, but, listen, I think, I personally think this is a bad move by uh, Manhattan. I don't like the idea that, first of all, you didn't notice this when you first hired him. 
I think that's an oversight on the athletic department at Manhattan that you don't notice that he didn't graduate. I think that's something you double check. It shouldn't be that long. That's just where you call up Kentucky and you'd be like, hey, can I get a copy of his transcript and his degree? Or you ask him, can I have a copy of your degree and your transcript? And they, and they, I, I maybe they did, maybe he lied. I don't know. I don't, obviously don't know the backstory. Um, but I, I don't think this is a good move. I think it's a great move for them basketball wise because they're going to be good still. They're going to be a good program because he's a fantastic coach. But I think from a moral standpoint, you are a college basketball coach and you lied on your resume and you don't have a degree right yeah. now. Yeah. What is a parent what is a parent gonna say to you when you're in a living room trying to recruit that player saying you lied on your resume, you didn't have a degree for this this X amount of years that you coached, that you were a head coach, what can you say about that? What can you what can you come up with that will change the parents' minds yeah. about that? I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that um, to give you the backstory a little bit on, on Massiello and Manhattan not realizing right away, I think um, from what I've heard, he was an assistant coach there at Manhattan and helped out before he moved. Or I don't know if he was an assistant coach. He helped out before he moved on to being an assistant of Patino at Louisville. So when he came back to take the first head coach job at Manhattan, mm -hmm. It's construed that possibly they just overlooked it since they had already had him in their system and said, we know this guy, so we're not going to thoroughly over, you know, we're not going to thoroughly go th through a procedure. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I've heard up until this point. But I, I, I agree with you. Um, I think, though, that you said they're going to be a good basketball basketball program now that he's back. Well, granted, they are losing three starters and their three top scorers, so he's going to have a really tough no, job right. on his hand when he comes back. No, right, yeah. But... Um, do, I want to ask you something. Do you think that his players are going to buy into completely what he told them after the way he led this team, the philosophy, the way he founded the team and built the foundation and everything he did? Is there no little bit of hesitation in these players' minds to buy into him again, to buy into what he's saying, to, 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 uh, to, to let him lead them again? As much... As Steve Mazziel appears to be, let's just say, an unpersonable individual on the sideline, the players love playing for him. Yeah. You can see it in every huddle. They listen to every word. You talk to them after the game in a press conference, they will praise their coach. They love playing for him. This was before but I, I he chose to leave Manhattan. I think that the batch of players now, having played under him, will forgive him. Yeah. I think it's the players incoming that are going to have the problem. as Put they're the gonna, walls they're, up. Yeah, that's going to be a little sketchy because the fact of the matter is for him to come back after making headlines with ESPN, getting on a national television, pushing Louisville to the brink, and then having your name plastered over this controversy, you are now known as the coach who lied on his resume. Right. I think, I think it's going to be hard because the players that come in and the players that are still there now are going to have to deal with the ridicule that Mazziel is going to face Every single road game he goes to. That's true. Imagine him coming Can to Iona imagine next the year. Chance. Oh, boy. Him coming to Iona next year is going to be an event to watch. Because they're I don't think the players will be watching. I don't think the audience will be watching the game. I think they'll be watching Mazziello on the sideline yeah. sweat as they chant him for 40 Reza straight minutes. May. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be absolutely Reza ridiculous. May. I agree. With you. I mean, no, that's absolutely right. But one thing that, um, you know, um, with with his his choice to leave Manhattan you cannot crucify him for choosing to do that for the simple fact that that's how college basketball works you do well you get offered something that you can only accept as somebody watching him you know take that offer because you, you need as a person you need to better your life you know you need to better he's going to he was going to make more money he was going to move on going to make millions to, yeah to a better program you know he has a family he has a life you can't you know crucify him on that what you can crucify him on is the fact that right before he accepted that deal he engraved in everybody's mind that he loved Manhattan that Manhattan was his home that he was never going to leave them that that you know it, it, he was going to live and die with the Jaspers and then he goes and, and takes that contract so with that being said to me you know there's got to be just an awkward sense of disownment in players that have played under him and players that, you know, obviously, like you said, that'll judge him coming in well, when he comes back. I think educated sports fans have to know that when a coach says that or a player, it's with a grain of salt.
because they're going to say it to, to win over the fans. I think that educated fans know that, yes, you may love playing here, but at the same time, money talks. You have to know that. Jerry know, Maguire, yeah. show me the money, yeah. right? I mean, you got to do it. I mean, looking at, a, looking at a hockey thing, I believe Ryan Callahan said numerous times he loves playing in New York, loves playing in New York, and they couldn't agree to a contract, a contract extension, and then he was traded away from the Rangers. So, That's I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you, but, you're good, you, lo you do love playing there. You're going to miss it. But guess what? Sometimes it's a business, and you got to remember it's a business. I understand that, and that's why I just said I would not crucify him for that at all. He's acceptable. It's acceptable to do that. It's his right to do that. What I'm talking about is the timing, how it was – you just beat – I mean, you just took – you took Louis to the That's break. why that – You had to be having on your radar that you may be getting an offer – a, you know, a job offer somewhere else, something that you're going to spend your time up until that point where you just did that to Louisville, engraving and pounding into Manhattan fans' minds that Manhattan is where you'll always be, that you love them to death, that that's everything to you, and then right, in, like, basically a day later, take a contract? Listen, educated sports fans know that he was going to get a contract. If you're an educated Manhattan fan, you knew he wasn't going to be there long. So then why is you as Manha Masiello? Because he why do you take that approach it doesn't mean it okay just because he said it doesn't mean it's not like he wasn't lying when he said it that, that's why that's why i don't understand what you're saying because he's gonna say it sure you can't blame him for saying that because it's true you can't blame me do you want him to lie and say i've enjoyed it at manhattan but it's it's been okay i'm looking for other options now no you want him to be honest and say guess what he did love it there but you listen. He, it's a business. No, but it's a business. He's gonna say that after a press conference, after I, a tough loss, he's gonna say he loves his players. Gonna say he loves his team because it's true. It is true. But you can't talk about Manhattan and your future. You can't say Manhattan is where I'm always gonna be, and I will not leave Manhattan. If you're gonna leave them three, three do you have a like, quote saying where he wants to stay in Manhattan for the rest of his career? Do you have a quote? There were, yes, that? there were quotes. Okay, were you need to find me one. Okay, let's look it up right now. Well, you need to find me well, one. Well, I don't have service on my phone. Well, you know, why didn't you bring your laptop? Look, can you can you no. Google it for me? No. Oh, you're not gonna find me my no. quote? Oh, that's mean. Cranky Stanko strikes again. Because <laughs> I I'm pretty sure I know the article too that that he said it. Um, listen, I listen. You cannot. Be angry at him for saying that because every coach has said it, and he's I, not the first one. I will, f I will find you the article, and I will show you that article. Uh, the our next show of where he stated that he, Manhattan was where he was always going to be, and he would never leave them. I'll well, maybe, him. maybe he meant spiritually. <laughs> maybe he meant my soul will always be in the sixth borough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, then I don't want you if I'm U.S. I mean, if I'm the players there. But listen, I, I agree with you. I know that it's a business. I know, like I said, how did I start things off? That that's what he needed to do. You know, it's just that the way that he went about it, where it was, you know, hours later that he accepted it after he passionately said he was going to stay with Manhattan leads to me believing that, you know, how are the athletes going to accept him back? You, you know, know what's also crazy is that he might have said that, and guess what? He, he's a smart guy. He knows he's losing three starters next year. He knows his team is not as talented next year. He knows that his team is going to be, uh, let's just say, not at the top of the preseason poll, I don't think. Right. Um, granted, they still might be in the in the upper half, but again, he's losing a lot of talent. He knew he's, his team's not going to be as good next year. Like, he knows that, and that's obviously why another reason why he accepted the job, because he'd rather go to a place where he has the the expectation where it's going to take time to rebuild. But at yeah. Manhattan, you've built the expectation of winning, and how are fans going to react when the team's not winning? No, I agree. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, I can't – I mean, that's – he wanted to move on to a team that he, he could start, I guess, if you will, um, you know, I guess start – Start building, mold into his own yeah, mold, creation. Exactly, he's mold into his creation, and not uh, a team that he's going to be losing what he already molded. Well, guess what? He may never get an opportunity to mold another team again after this entire scandal. So, well, he's back though. It, it, I, oh, he mold, may never get oh, another, another opportunity oh, to I go see. to a big conference. No, I agree with you. I mean, I think that he's lucky to have a job. I, I agree. <laughs> I would, I wouldn't have hired him, but hey, I'm it, not in that front office. I don't know what's going on. There was but. a very fine line where it could have went uh, the other way, and he could have been jobless in, the, in 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 at least the college head coaching basketball market. I wonder how he's going to complete his degree. Online classes, probably online classes, right? I mean, I hope he's not sitting in class with students. I, I mean, mean, I'm assuming it's online classes. 
right. I would assume so since they are they said he should get him done within the summer. So Yeah, summer. online classes it is. So Steve Mazziello will be sitting on his laptop at his kitchen table taking some online classes. I want to know what classes he's going to take. I want that to be reported. <laughs> I want to know what classes, not lie on, How do not lie on your resume? <laughs> yeah, work etiquette. How about something like that? <laughs> work, work media law and ethics or something like that. Just a class about morality. How to build a truthful resume. Oh, God, that'd be great. Oh, I, really excited. I really hope that gets reported. I really do. I hope it's like pottery, an online pottery class. <laughs> pottery. Well, I mean, um, Manhattan, the the, um, the uh, president of the college um, had made the made the statement that um, it was a, uh, how did he word it? It was a poor ju lack of judgment, lack of good judgment that re um, resulted in Massiello lying and it wasn't an, an intentional action. So I don't know how he sees that. He said that he was on track to complete his degree, but just didn't follow up with it. So I don't see how that's not intentional. And it should, you know, poor judgment. Isn't that the same thing as intention? You know, being. I know he didn't intentionally try to do anything mm -hmm. to n prevent himself from getting a job, but I, I don't know. To me, it's intentional that you didn't follow up with your degree. It's a shady situation, but now it's been resolved. Uh, so yeah. it's yeah. whether we agree with it or not, doesn't matter. Manhattan's getting Steve Mazziello back, hopefully after the summer, as long as he completes his degree. And I'm sure the Jaspers will double check this time. <laughs> you can say that again. Uh, but for opposites of track today, I think we, uh, I think we've, uh, we're ready to bid farewell. Get this shirt off of me. Uh, and John will be able to take that shirt off and hand it back to me with I'm all that spit sweat. Spit on it after the sh after the show. <laughs> John Stanko has uh, has been he's had a good day. We'll call it a good day in sarcastic terms. With the uh, the Yankee, <laughs> he's giving me a death stare. On that note, I'm gonna put the music on and I'm gonna say goodbye. Wise we'll see you decision, next, Anthony. Carlo. We'll see you next. It's a wise week. decision. <laughs> we'll see you next week, everyone. <laughs>